So now that I'm rid of that ridiculous, awesome thing, uh, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce you our speaker for today, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. He graduated from Eastern University and Duke Divinity School. He has authored several books, including To Baghdad and Beyond and The Wisdom of Stability, which are all engaging to the mind and spirit. Jonathan is an associate minister at St. John's Baptist Church in Durham, North Carolina, where he is involved with peacemaking and reconciliation efforts within his traditionally black church and uh, the rest of the community. He is an editor for two journals and the director for the School of Conversion. In my opinion, one of the coolest and most influential parts of his life is when he went to Iraq with his wife, Leah, as part of a Christian peacemaking team uh, before the war, or before the American Allied invasion in 2003, which led him to his conversion to new monasticism. He's the leader among the new monastic movement uh, and lives in a new monastic community with his, with his f family and friends who uh, devote their lives to eating, praying, and living life together. This is an amazing man of God who has an amazing walk with God. And we are so lucky to have him here. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you today. And uh, I'm especially glad to be here for your Global Focus Week on conflict and reconciliation. This, uh, this image that's up here, uh, I think it's great because if you take a look at it, it's, uh, it's a beautiful tree at the top and a mushroom cloud at the bottom, uh, which is a fairly decent picture of the world that we live in. Uh, I spent the weekend here in beautiful Santa Barbara, which is, uh, which is just as pretty as the top of that tree uh, everywhere I could see. Uh, and yet, uh, if, if we're living in the creation that Scripture describes... Uh, then we know that every place, every person, every creature and part of God's creation is, is like this right here. It, uh, it, it's beautiful to see in some parts, and it's just tragically broken in other parts. And, and so um, it's good to spend a week reflecting on what it means that, uh, that God has saved this creation, a creation that is, uh, that is, that is beautiful and that is broken and that has been and is being redeemed. So I wanted to start this morning by talking a little bit about what it means that we live um, uh, in the midst of the longest war that this nation has ever fought. Um, we're over 10 years now in, into this war uh, that, that began in Afghanistan and spread to Iraq. Uh, it was originally called uh, a war on terror or a war on terrorism. Um, but you should know from the name that that's a war that can never end. Um, a war that tries to get rid of an idea. It's a war that's been going on for a while and that I suspect will go on uh, for quite some time. But this war that began <clears throat> after the interruption of September 11th is a war that I think has exposed in our society a lot of the conflict and distress. If you watch news shows, you've seen the political uh, disagreements, the political disagreements that have gotten uh, more and more heated over the years as this war has continued. Um, of course, we're in the midst right now of the uh, Occupy Wall Street campaign that began several weeks ago, which I think is a response to the economic divisions that uh, a war like this manifests. After all, you can't spend billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, year after year on a war like this without somebody feeling the implications of those, of those dollars going elsewhere. And so, all of this seems to stir in us and in our society uh, an awareness that something is wrong. I think that, that this war may be for our generation uh, the one thing we have in common that reminds us that the tree isn't all green and beautiful, that somewhere deep down something is broken. I had a pastor when I was in college who told me uh, just after September 11th, he said, the Vietnam War was for my generation the sign that told us not everything was well in the world. Uh, he said, I think for your generation, it's going to be September 11th. And indeed, I was on a beautiful college campus like this one when September 11th happened. Uh, I, I remember the morning well. It was, a, it was a beautiful sunny day like this on the East Coast, uh, Eastern College, that other Christian college on the East Coast. And uh, uh, I was in a philosophy of science class. Uh, 
riveting thing to do at 8.30 in the morning, we were discussing Thomas Kuhn and the structures of scientific revolutions. I remember well Stephen Gatlin, the professor who was teaching us uh, about Kuhn's notion of a paradigm shift. Uh, if you know science, you know science is about the facts. Of course, in, in, in literature, you learn stories. In, in, in Bible, you learn about uh, the, the scriptures, and we learn about our faith. But in science, you learn about the facts. And yet what Kuhn taught us was that the facts are always interpreted through some lens, that, that we always have assumptions that we bring to the facts, and that, and that sometimes what happens is the facts accumulate to, to, to a point that the old way of explaining them doesn't work anymore, and we need a new explanation Kuhn called that a paradigm shift. Of course, uh, Galileo is the great explanation before, uh, the great example of this explanation before Galileo. Um, there was uh, the assumption that the earth was the center of the world. And uh, people had watched the stars and the heavens and, and had observed uh, lots of things that happened, uh, but could make all of that make sense within a framework of the earth being at the center of the world until Galileo got out his telescope and, and taking the facts that he saw and combining them with all the facts that people had before him, Galileo said that as a matter of fact, the earth isn't the center of the world. The earth is revolving around the sun. It was a new explanation, but it could explain all of the facts. And so there was a paradigm shift. Everything changed. We were talking about that. We were talking about that that morning when someone knocked on the door and said that a plane had flown into a building uh, in, in New York City, it, it looked like it might be an accident until a few minutes later when somebody came and said that another one had flown in and it was clear that the country was under attack. And, and immediately this country was, was in turmoil as people were trying to figure out what was happening. Why would anybody do this? Why do people hate us? Why was someone so disturbed that they flew two planes into the symbols of our economic power and another into the symbol of our military power. 9-11 was a great exposure of the conflict that is deep in our world and a conflict in which our way of life is somehow implicated here in this country. And, 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 and so trying to make sense of that, trying to process that has, has been a, a, a big part of my journey over the past 10 years. Shortly after that, uh, I was working as a journalist when this country was beginning to talk about a war in Iraq. And uh, my beat as a journalist was faith and politics. I was supposed to be covering uh, what the church was saying about a, a potential war. So I interviewed. I interviewed all the people who were experts in the just war tradition. I learned about this tradition in the church that teaches us to think about when it's, when it's right to go to war, when out of love for neighbor we should, uh, we should use force to defend uh, people who are who are weak. I learned that tradition, and I also talked to the people who are pacifists, to the people who say that Jesus was nonviolent, Jesus practiced nonviolence, and that Christians should do that too. And as I listened to these two groups, what I heard, what I heard from these people who understood the traditions of reflection on war and peace in the Christian tradition, was that nobody thought it was a good idea for the United States to go to war. It didn't seem to meet the just war criteria, and of course the pacifists are always against war, and yet it was clear to me that tens of thousands of American Christians were already deployed to the Middle East and were going to go to war when the president gave the order. And so um, I began looking to see if there were any Christians who were thinking differently about this, if there was any other way uh, that people could imagine responding faithfully in our time. And I learned about a group called the Christian Peacemaker Teams. Uh, Christian Peacemaker Teams who in the mid-1980s uh, had responded to a call uh, to, to put the, the active nonviolence of Jesus into practice. That is, to get in the way of conflict, as they say, to, to get in between people who are fighting, but to do that as Christians who believe that Jesus interrupted our violence by laying himself down in love, and that if we follow Jesus, we're called to do the same. And so, for some 20 years, they had been involved in conflict situations around the world. And I learned that they were already in Iraq, building up a peace team, a team of people who were in Baghdad and in, uh, under the threat of the shock and awe campaign that this country was talking about, were saying, we're going to stay here, we're going to be with the Iraqi people. My wife and I talked about this, we talked to our church about it, we were quite impressed, and we sent a letter to the Christian peacemaker teams and said that if, if they needed uh, any help, 
uh, we, we'd be glad to help any way we could. We were like uh, you folks here. We were in our early 20s. We were still in college. Uh, we thought maybe we could put stamps on envelopes. Uh, I, I wasn't sure that we could do anything very helpful, but, but I was impressed by what they were doing. And um, a couple weeks later, they sent a letter back and said, uh, we're sending a group to Baghdad in two weeks. Can you go? This is not what we were expecting. But we prayed and, and, and we tried to listen. And what we heard was that, was that this was a call to, to trust Jesus. To trust not only that Jesus saves us and uh, has a home for us in heaven, but that Jesus has given us a new way of life. And that it's a way that we can live even in the midst of the worst things that are happening in the world. And so we said that we would go. We ended up getting on a plane from JFK in New York uh, on the same day when George Bush made the announcement that if Saddam Hussein and his sons didn't leave Iraq in 48 hours, that the country was going to attack. And so we ended up in Baghdad as the shock and awe campaign was happening. And we were there uh, visiting people whose, whose homes had been hit by these bombs, visiting people who were in cars that were hit on the road. We went to hosp a hospital. I'll never forget meeting the woman who was sitting beside her, her son, who was pockmarked with the fragmentation bombs, the little bombs that blow up and send off like shotgun pellets. And, and it looked like the kid had measles and, and he was sitting in the bed and she pulled out a picture of her daughter who hadn't made it, uh, who was in the same room and was hit by the same uh, shrapnel that her son had been hit by. I never, I'll never forget the man who said to us, if this is democracy, we don't want it. If this is liberation, you can keep it. It was, it was a terrible, terrible time to, to be there and to be with the Iraqi people. And yet, it was an amazing time to receive hospitality from people who had next to nothing. And yet, people who were gracious and said to us, we love Americans. We don't like your president so much, but we love Americans, they said. And, 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 they, and they welcomed us into their homes and, and, and they took care of us. Of course, they had suffered under a terrible regime with Saddam Hussein, and they were used to distinguishing uh, the leadership from the people, and, and they had an incredible capacity to simply go on with life in the midst of all that was happening. We were not there very long before Saddam Hussein's regime, which was crumbling and which was uh, desperate to stay in control, kicked us out of the country. Uh, they kicked us out for not following all of their rules. Uh, they had lots of rules. And uh, and, and, and when we were kicked out of the country, we had to drive out through the western desert, the desert that's on the west side of Iraq. Um, we drove out on the highway, well, the highway that was built. It's a very nice highway uh, normally. It was built to carry oil uh, back and forth. And so it's, um, it's, it's every bit as good as the freeways um, here in California. And yet it had been bombed for uh, over a week. And so there were blown out cars. There were collapsed bridges. Uh, it was a mess of a road, and yet the, the people who were driving us, because they didn't want to be on the road, were going 80, 85 miles an hour. We were in three cars, driving very fast uh, across this desert, and one of our cars hit a piece of shrapnel in the road. It blew the tire, careened into a ditch. Three guys hit their, hit their heads uh, on the windshield and on the seats in front of them and split them open, and so they stumbled out of this car in the middle of the desert, not knowing what they were going to do, bleeding uh, in, in desperate need of help. A car of Iraqis, a, a station wagon, they said, stopped, took them into their car, and drove them into this little village called Rutba. And in, in Rutba, they found a doctor. Uh, the, the doctor was in a little makeshift clinic that they had put together. And this doctor said to them, three days ago, your country bombed our hospital. But whether you're Iraqi or American, Christian or Muslim, we'll take care of you. And he sewed up their heads and saved their lives. Lee and I were in a car in front of this one. We hadn't even seen that it wrecked. And by the time we got back, we, we found our friends. One of them was standing outside this building waving when we drove up. And, uh, and they told us this story. We went to this doctor and we asked him, what, what do we owe you for your service? And this doctor said, you don't owe me anything. He said, please just go and tell the world what's happening here in Rutba. And so we came back to the United States in, in 2003 telling that story. And the more I told that story, the more I realized that it was the Good Samaritan story. You know that story in the Gospel of Luke, where the person who's supposed to be the enemy of the Jew is the only one who stops and saves them. And, and, and Jesus tells that story as a story of what God's love looks like in a broken world, in a world that's, that's, that, that's shot through with conflict and with divisions. Uh, God's love looks like your enemy loving you 
and showing you what it means uh, to receive God's love. And at the end of that, at the end of that passage, Jesus says, "Go and do likewise." And we felt like as we had lived that story, that that was a word to us. And so that's how we came to be in Durham, North Carolina, uh, as a community called the Rootba House, named after this little village in Iraq. The Rootba House is a uh, sometimes described as a new monastic community. It's described that way because we've learned a lot from the monastic tradition of the church, from, from all these saints that we were talking about and celebrating earlier today. Um, many of those saints lived uh, a monastic life in community together with other folks who, who wanted to give their whole life to one thing. That's the mono of monasticism, one thing, which is to serve God with our whole lives. It's sometimes called a new monastic community, but it's, it, it's, it's actually fairly simple. It's, it's people living together, sharing life together, praying together in the mornings, sharing meals together, sharing our resources together, and sharing life together with, uh, with folks who show up. Um, some of them because they're interested in community and some of them because they need a home. And uh, in that place, what we found is that, is that God is teaching us what reconciliation means. So I tell you all that to say something about the context in which, uh, in which I'm reading this passage from 2 Corinthians today. I want to back up to the 16th verse, uh, the verse that comes right before this, because I think it, it, it helps to frame what Paul is saying. So from now on, he says, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no, no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What, what Paul describes is two ways of seeing the world. There, there is, of course, a, a way of seeing the world where the conflicts are there and people are broken and what we have to do is simply deal with the reality. We have to, we have to deal with it the best way we can. Maybe it's the, the lesser of two evils. Maybe it's what you call realpolitik. But what you have to do is, is the best you can do with what we've been given. That's the world's way of seeing things. And yet Paul says we don't any longer see from the world's point of view. We don't see that way because we've been interrupted We've been interrupted by God in Christ who came to reconcile us to himself. And, and what God has shown us is a different way of being in the world. A way that often doesn't make sense because if you look at it, you have to say, that'll just get you killed. Which, of course, is what it did for Jesus. It just got him killed. And yet the reason we can trust this way is because God raised Jesus from the dead. And if death can't do us in, then there's nothing to be afraid of in this world. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus, that the power of resurrection is the mark that we don't have to listen to the realism of the world that says that, that, that there's only one way to do things, that we have to do things according to the world's point of view. I think what, what Paul is talking about here is a paradigm shift that there's one way of seeing the world, a way of seeing the world that we've learned from our experience. And, uh, and we've, we've not only learned that from our personal experience, but we've inherited a way of seeing the world and a way of acting in it. We've inherited it from the people who've gone before us. There's a lot of worldly wisdom to this, of course. Uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, of case examples that have built up to this understanding of the world. And yet, Jesus has interrupted that. And Jesus' interruption of that confuses our assumptions about how we ought to live in the world. I always think of a, a story that my friend from Rwanda told me. Um, Rwanda, of course, suffered a terrible conflict in 1994 that's still, uh, in some ways, manifesting itself throughout Africa. If you go see this Invisible Children film, you'll, you'll certainly learn about one of the manifestations of that uh, th that's now uh, happening in Uganda. But in 1994, uh, because of uh, racial division that had been imposed on the country by the Belgians uh, for years and years, uh, there was a, a group called the Hutus that were a majority, and they uh, decided uh, in, in, in the organization of a Hutu power movement uh, to wipe out the Tutsis from the country, the Tutsi minority 
that had been put into power by the Belgians many, many years before. It was a terrible massacre, a terrible massacre uh, partly because uh, people were killed by their neighbors and not, uh, not at a distance with bombs, not even with guns, but, but mostly with, with clubs and machetes. People went door to door killing people who they had known. These are people whose children had married each other, a, a terrible, terrible conflict. And, and in the midst of that, there was this one Hutu boy that my friend told me about. A Hutu boy who had been raised by Tutsis because there were lots of mixed families in this time. And this boy had been adopted when his parents died. He'd been raised by a Tutsi family. And when the Hutu power group came to, to their community uh, to begin killing Tutsis, they fled. They fled into the marshes. And they were hiding under little trees. And, and uh, they, they only had a little bit of food that they took with them. But for weeks, they were out there. And as, as they began to realize that they were starving, they turned to this Hutu boy and they said to him, you don't have to die. Uh, your identity card says that you're Hutu. They won't kill you. You can go back. And so they sent him back to town. And when this kid stumbled into town and these, these people who were systematically killing Tutsis uh, asked to see his identity card, the, 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 they said, uh, what are you? And, and the boy couldn't answer. Uh, he didn't know. Was he, was he Hutu? Was he Tutsi? He, he had a card that said he was Hutu, but he had always lived among Tutsis. He, he was confused. And uh, the, the Interahamwa, the, the Hutu power group that was, that was doing the persecution, said, uh, the poor boy, he's just confused. Leave him alone. And my friend, who's from Rwanda, said, I only wish that more Christians had been confused. I wish that more Christians had been confused in the midst of that conflict. I, th I think that sort of confusion that, uh, that says that we're not sure that, that we fit into the categories that the world writes on us. I think that's the confusion that we're called to by this message of reconciliation. Of course, the confusion is uh, a confusion that Jesus has initiated because we have been saved by grace, because we've been saved by the, the initiative of, of Jesus to become like us and to lay his life down for us, there's a, there's a confusion of categories. We who were God's enemies, Paul says, have become God's friends. We've become God's friends because Jesus was willing to die for his enemies. And because of that confusion, we, we, we learn to, to, to see things differently and to confuse things in the world. In our neighborhood, we began to realize after we had been there for a few years that some of the, the, the young kids who were growing up, they were growing up in, in a situation where their, their, their families were often not able to support them very well. And when they got to middle school, they started to, to get involved in gangs. And these gangs gave them a sense of belonging. And, and we wanted to offer them something, uh, something concrete. We wanted to offer them a gospel that was, that was some alternative to these gangs. And, and, and yet we, we began to realize that the that the ways of presenting the gospel that, that we were so used to uh, were often insufficient. Uh, the, the good evangelical background that some of us had taught us that what these people needed was a personal relationship with Jesus, which is what they need for sure, a personal relationship. With, but if all you give a kid who's, who's getting involved in gangs is a personal relationship with Jesus, then they take that personal relationship with Jesus home with them and, and, and they still have all the same mess to deal with. And so, and, and, and so we, we started thinking, well, well what, else, what else is it that they need beyond, beyond a realization that God loves them and that, uh, and, and that their, their heart can be healed on the inside? And so, and so the, the progressive Christian traditions that, that some of us have also been influenced by, uh, they told us that, that these kids were, were victims of systemic injustice and that, uh, you know, what they need is, is some, some, some change in the structures in their lives. And, uh, and, and, and what a neighborhood like ours needs is a medical clinic. Because after all, these kids who get involved in these gangs are going to get shot. And uh, when they get shot, uh, they, they need a place that can save them. They can take the bullet out. Which is true. There's, there, there's, a, great, there's a great need for that kind of thing in, in our context. But but if all the doctor does is, is sew up the person who's shot and, 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 and sends them back home, they go home to the same situation. You, you see, the, the problem is that these kids need a new gang. They need a new, a new family to be part. They need the personal relationship with Jesus. They need structural change in their life. And yet they, they need a whole new network of people, of a family that calls them, that calls them their own. And, and, and I think this this, this strange confusion of relationships that Jesus teaches us is, is, is what, what we're called to be. And so, and so what we've begun to imagine ourselves as is a kind of a family 
a family that welcomes uh, folks into a new identity. And as we get to know our new brothers and sisters, they teach us uh, to, to imagine in new ways who we are. And at the same time, they can imagine new possibilities and a new future for who they are. That, I think, is the ministry of reconciliation that we're called to. That, that God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. That's the good news of the gospel. And, and that's the good news that kind of confuses who we are and our way of seeing the world. It, it calls us to a kind of paradigm shift. And as we engage in the ministry of reconciliation, that's what we're, that's what we're called to do. To invite friends and neighbors and even people who we thought were our enemies to be part of this family with us so together we can learn what it means to focus our lives on Jesus. Now, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I want to teach you a song because the only way you can, you, the only way you can keep going on this road is to learn how to sing it. So if you stand up with me real quick. I want to teach you a song that comes from one of the greatest Jesus movements that this country has known. It's a song called, I woke up this morning with my eyes stayed on Jesus. I heard Vincent Harding, one of the great leaders of the civil rights movement, say once that, uh, that when the journalists came to describe what was happening, they called it a civil rights movement. But nobody, nobody sang, I woke up this morning with my, with my mind stayed on civil rights. He said, we sang, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. So keep your mind stayed on Jesus, who has confused us and invited us into the confusing reality, uh, the new reality of the new creation. And, uh, and, and we can sing a song that, that goes like this. I know y'all can sing because I heard you before. If you can clap on two and four, it'll help this song make sense too. It goes like this. I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Y'all keep singing that. Keep your mind stayed on Jesus. Amen.